Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, Professor John Robson on the Magna Carta. Thank you very much. Again, I, I do apologize for being late. I shall be early from here on in. Uh, I do want to talk about Magna Carta, one of my favorite topics. Besides, liberty is the old days, and in point of fact, we'll get to Magna Carta sooner or later, but I'm going to start with King Alfred. One of my little pet causes is to get a statue of Alfred the Great on Parliament Hill and uh, get a little account of Alfred and the cakes, because I... When I teach history, do American history, and talk about the Constitution, first thing I do is ask the class, how many people know about Alfred and the Cakes? And I never see a hand. And I don't know how many hands I'd get here, but... Okay, there's, there's a good one. It's possibly a apocryphal story, but it concerns the uh, King of Wessex in the worst part of the Dark Ages. Uh, came to the throne as a young man due to the usual combination of slaughter and chaos. And was promptly set upon by the Danes. His camp was ambushed at Christmas, and he was nearly killed. And Alfred fled incognito, as the story goes, sought refuge in a, a cowherd's hut, and asked the man's wife if he could have, sit by the fire and warm himself, and not much like the look of him, but she said, oh, all right, but just watch the little loaves, the cakes, and don't let them burn, because I have to go out and glean. And Alfred sat down by the fire, started cleaning his weapons, thinking about where are my fame scattered to, is Mercia still on my side, how do I beat the Danes? Of course, got lost in thought, and next thing he knew, the hat was full of smoke, and the woman was screaming at him from the door, you no good lay about it. all I said was watch the cakes, and now look what you've done. And the punchline of the story is that rather than saying, on your knee, woman, I'm the king, or swatting her head off, or doing something else like that, he apologized to her. He said, I'm very sorry, I shouldn't have watched the cakes, it's my fault. And there are various elaborations to the story, because Alfred then does rally his men, defeats the Danes, forces them to submit to Christianity, retakes London, and then becomes a king who divides his time between governing justly, praying, and trying to educate his people. Taught himself Latin as an adult so he could translate things into Anglo-Saxon. Got the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles started. And this is a very to me, a very Anglosphere story about monarchy. I defy you to find a tale of this sort in Russian folklore or Persian folklore or Japanese folklore. It tells the English, and then it tells the Americans, and it tells Canadians, at least until recently, who they are. This is the nature of kingship in our kind of society. And, for instance, when the Americans had their revolution and they scraped together four ramshackle ships of which to take on only the British Navy, they named their flagship the Alfred. Because Alfred was, among other things, the father of the British Navy, but he was also their model of government. The Americans always believed themselves to be the inheritors of Anglo-Saxon liberty. And Magna Carta is just one part of that story, though it's an important part. And when I talk about this, I, I quote a leading constitutional expert who calls his country a land, perhaps the only one in the universe, in which political or civil liberty is the very end and scope of the Constitution. And people normally think this is kind of an American sentiment. I do teach American history and great fondness for the United States. But that's William Blackstone, writing in the 1760s about England, the nation that we would get a Constitution similar in principle to, and he has no doubt that this is the meaning of England's fundamental laws, is freedom. And I think this is an encouraging thing in a gathering of this sort because, you know, libertarians often feel kind of lonely. They have preoccupations that are not broadly shared. But the funny thing is, if you look at the long span of Canadian history, and by this I mean Canadian history going back to Alfred the Great, because we are part of this tradition, no matter what people try and tell you, you're not the weirdos. You just are the ones living in weird times. The, this understanding of who and what we are, um, John Milton called London the mansion house of liberty. The American revolutionaries talk about British liberties that they must preserve against a deformation of the British Constitution. This was the understanding for a long time, and I also therefore bring up uh, the story of Canute. He's a little better known, but he's known as the guy who thought he could stop the tides. He's a actually Danish interloper in some of the more troubled parts of Anglo-Saxon England's history, but the real story of Canute is somewhat different. His advisors were telling him, you're such a great king, you could even stop the tide. So Canute said, okay, somebody grab a chair, let's go down to the sea. He sat there at low tide, the waves came in, he said, I command you to halt, I'm the king, and they didn't. And he turned to his advisors and he said, listen, you idiots, I'm the king, I get flattery for free, I don't pay you for that. I need you to tell me the truth, I need you to tell me the bad news, because otherwise I'm going to make stupid decisions. And again, one, one cannot imagine this story with the Emperor Xerxes. 
Even if it had happened, we'd never know about it. Uh, and I think all of this is important because of a, a remark of John Gray, who, he quoted Ludwig Wittgenstein, who said that trying to repair a broken tradition is like trying to fix a spider web with your bare hands. And my thought on this is, well, at least we have a spider web. You know, no doubt the Canadian tradition of liberty is broken, but at least we have one, and this makes an enormous difference. Uh, and when you, when you think about the story of Alfred and the fact that he governed justly, and he succeeded by a, a variety of Anglo-Saxon kings, about which we know comparatively little, obviously, but there was this ideal of kingship, of just rule, of rule that took account of the sentiments of the community, that was founded in some sense in popular consent, and that put justice above favoritism. Didn't always work, but that was the idea. And this is very important because in 1066, William, well, he was called William the Bastard, and this was obviously not on, so he needed a new name, so he conquered England and became William the Conqueror. And, you know, again, William the Conqueror was an ungentle man. Uh, apparently he would turn black with fury when crossed. Nevertheless, when he took over, one of the things he said he would do is he would observe the laws of Edward the Confessor, the last Anglo-Saxon king who sat on the throne long enough to make a dent in it. And although William may have been a cynic and he may have been lying, it's the promise is worth noting. This sort of backward-looking statement that I will govern justly because I will govern the way you have traditionally been governed. Well, the, you go through the early uh, Norman and Plantagenet kings, and there's a good deal of civil war and chaos and violence. And uh, then eventually you get this real lemon of a monarch, King John. There's a rebellion. The barons drag him to Runnymede, and they make him sign seal Magna Carta. But when they do this, and people often misunderstand this, there are several misunderstandings about Magna Carta. One being that this was some new idea, that the barons said, hey, you know what? We don't like the way we're governed. We'd like to be governed differently. That's the opposite of the truth. The barons went to John and said, we want you to govern the way the kings have always governed England, Normans and Anglo-Saxons. We want you to go back to the right way of doing things. And we've made a list of all the things that are meant to happen and that have always happened. And you're going to promise us you're not going to stop doing these things. And this is really quite a remarkable departure from the way people think about liberty and from the problem. Think of a spider web here. The problem people have in places like Egypt or Iraq or China, if they want to create liberty, they have to build a tradition that was never there. But in England, even in the time of King John, uh, when, by the way, uh, government officials could be fined for inefficiency in the very early 13th century in England. Things weren't that bad. But when people want to get the king back under control, they tell him, you have got to stop breaking the rules. You've got to stop changing things, and you've got to go back to these rules, uh, including this nullus liber homo capiatur, well imprisonatur, out, etc., which I always have to translate. <clears throat> it's clause 39 in the original one, and what it says is, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. And it, not only is this a, a guarantee of due process, that is to say that there's not just a promise that you'll be free as in, say, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, but it's, it's based on a set of procedures that let you stop the state from doing things it must not do. But also, no free man. Magna Carta is addressed to everybody, which is one of the oddest things about it. And some people said, oh, of course, it's an aristocratic document. It's only for the barons. But it wasn't. Nobody ever read it that way. And when you think about their attitude toward the past and the way England had always been governed, uh, one of the stories of Alfred and the Cakes is that after he does establish his kingship, he sends some little loaves to this man and his wife, and when they open them, there are gold coins inside. But there's a dignity of the common man which translates into legal standing for the common man in Magna Carta that is quite extraordinary. Another clause in Magna Carta says, to no one will we sell, to no one deny, or delay right or justice. And that is a really critical piece of legal rule. And again, understood as what has always been the case. And John's not doing it, and he better smarten up. Not understood as some new idea that we've had. And the way courts work today, for instance, justice is delayed. And in some sense, you could even say it's sold, not venally, but simply because you can't afford a lawyer 
to go through the proceedings that often get initiated. There's something about our legal system today that doesn't fit what Magna Carta promised us would happen. Another interesting point, by the way, about Magna Carta, it says ordinary lawsuits shall not follow the royal court around, but shall be held in a fixed place. Which might seem trivial, but the, the Anchorman and, and Plantagenet kings, they traveled incessantly. They would ride horses 2,000 miles in the course of a year around their kingdoms, checking up on everything in England and in France. And only the rich could actually afford to go over to the king and say, I'm trying to sue somebody. But John promises that you can get justice locally. There will be fair courts accessible to ordinary people. Uh, an even more amazing clause of the original Magna Carta says, no scootage or aid may be levied in our kingdom without its general consent, except for the ransom of a person to make our eldest son a knight and once to marry our eldest daughter. For these purposes, only a reasonable aid may be levied. And this, now, this is a very curious part of Magna Carta because it seems to promise, you know, no taxation without representation. It shall be no aid without the general consent of the kingdom, but at this point in England, there is no parliament. There's very, nothing that really resembles a parliament, and there's been some argument about what existed in Anglo-Saxon times, but the, the Anglo-Saxon Vitangamo, this gathering of the notables, it, it was not a corporate body with its own rules and procedures. Uh, nevertheless, there is this Anglo-Saxon tradition that, that you're consulted. And here's one of the really weird things about England. Uh, and the, this is the... A critical point about the English Constitution that is often missed, and that is its basis in popular sovereignty. See, by the time of King John, there's no parliament. Where do laws come from in England? How does England make laws? Not by the king saying, do this, do that. This does not happen. The king is in sort of military command, and with the aid of the notables, he can make particular rules for particular emergencies if he has to. But England has a very articulate body of law. under. Um, John's father, Henry II, didn't quite make the great, but one of the great kings of England. Henry established a set system of royal courts that tended to supplant feudal courts and that people liked them because things were fair. And Henry's courts went around, or they sat, and when the case came before them, they discovered what the law was. They explored the common law, they took testimony from people about what the law was, and then they applied it. And the result of this is that Englishmen, by the time of Magna Carta, lived in a, under a rule of law, clear, established, reasonably well-known, people kept track of it. And it was derived not from the monarch, and not from a law-making body, but from the people. These were the rules the people had been willing to live under, and if they'd lived under them long enough, that gave them status as the law of the land. This is where the English common law comes from. It comes from the people, discovered by the judges. And so when Magna Carta comes along, it confirms the right of Englishmen to be governed by rules to which they have consented, as a fundamental principle of life in England, which no one can tamper with. Neither kings, nor barons, nor, in fact, commoners. Nobody can touch this stuff. And this is, this is in... Uh, 1215. Um, now, interestingly enough, Magna Carta, yeah? Um, are these laws established by local magistrates and precedent? Is that yeah, the, the royal magistrates, but local. Figure out what the rule has always been. And there's a certain amount of room for improvisation, but only when the rules conflict, they find the most reasonable one. And the result of this is a, a spectacular articulation of law with no lawmaking body other than the English people. And so, Magna Carta, by the way, is reissued in a number of versions, and some things that appear in the first one disappear quickly. One of them is this promise about consulting the kingdom. Others, a very strange 25 barons will supervise the king because we think John is a snake that disappears. Um, and yet, and so Magna Carta then is reissued, and it's read in all the counties, it's read in the cathedrals. This document is publicized throughout England with an efficiency that could not be matched by government today, despite the internet. <laughs> uh, but they, they take out this business about the consent of the kingdom. You think, oh, well, you know, it was nice while it lasted. But this, this is the very strange thing that happens next. And this is part of a story that... Englishmen have always had liberties, initially quite amorphous. The, these liberties are attacked by their rulers, primarily the monarchs to begin with, over and over again. And every time there's a squeeze from the executive, it doesn't break the liberties or confine them. It forces them into a clearer and harder shape. 
So the attempt by the Normans to get rid of Anglo-Saxon liberty leads us to Magna Carta. After John perishes from a surfeit of peaches and new ale, and possibly somebody dumped something into it because he really was pretty unpopular, um, his, his son, Henry III, succeeds one of the longest and least distinguished reigns in English history. Um, and uh, toward the end of his reign, uh, Simon de Montfort leads a rebellion. And he actually imprisons the king and his eventual successor, Ed, will be Edward I. And when he does this, Simon needs legitimacy. And the way he gets legitimacy is he summons a parliament in which he invites the great lords, the clerical and uh, lay, and the commons. Simon summons two commoners from every parliament. And this is really uh, knights from the shire, burgesses from the towns. And in, in, a, in a kind of formal precedent sense, this is unusual. But everybody recognizes this is the kind of way we do things in England. And that if we have a problem that requires a more formal solution than we used to have, this is a formal solution that fits the informal solution. So the fact that that clause disappeared from Magna Carta is of almost no effect. The fact is that Malfoy does this. Well, things end badly for Malfoy because Edward I, who the notoriously brutal Longshanks, escapes from prison, ambushes Malfoy, kills him, desecrates his body, and says, ha, ha, how do you like that? Edward then has to summon parliaments, and when Edward summons parliaments, he summons the lords, the clerics, and he summons the commoners. He keeps doing it, because that's how Englishmen do things. And by now we have uh, realized that we need a slightly more formal arrangement than we used to have, and so we have it. Now in 1297, Edward finds himself uh, with a very recalcitrant parliament, because like most English kings, he's flat broke. You know, we're talking pawn the crown jewels broke. We're talking two shillings and eightpence or something like that in the treasury. So he calls Parliament together, and they put before him a petition. The Latin name is De Tellagio Non Concedendo, and I make all my students memorize this, which they hate. Uh, <laughs> in which it says, No talager aid shall be later levied by us or our heirs in the realm without the goodwill and assent of the archbishops, bishops, earls, barons, knights, burgesses, and other freemen of our realm. So there is the actual formal statement of no taxation without representation. It comes from Edward I in 1297. By the time the Americans put this on the table in their revolution, they are asserting a right that is half a millennium old. And they know it. And they're proud of that. They're not looking forward. They're not inventing some new thing. They are looking backward over five centuries and more. Because again, to them, what Edward agreed to and Parliament insisted on was a more formal statement of an arrangement that had existed that ran back before the mind of man, basically, time immemorial. And you know, Edward's successors are an uneven bunch. Uh, some are bad, some are worse. Nevertheless, Parliament continues to meet. In thir by 1346, and we, the Commons is sitting separately. You don't even know how this happened, but there's a separate House of Commons by the middle of the 14th century. By 1376, they're electing their own speaker. And this is a very important thing, because if you don't count the votes, you're not really in control. But the Commons runs its own affairs from well before the Wars of the Roses. In fact, speaking of the Wars of the Roses, in 1401, Henry IV has taken the throne in a somewhat uh, irregular manner, mainly from a, from a king who was no good at all. And the Commons says to him, you know how we put petitions before you, and then when you're asking for money, well, you are going to answer our petitions before we give you any money. We don't care if you like it or not. The king says, okay, I agree. 1407, the commons clashes with the lords over a money bill, and they say, we represent the people who pay the money, so we have primacy on money bills. A rule that still exists in the American Congress, still exists in the British Parliament, exists in the Canadian Parliament. That dates back to 1407. 1414, when Henry V is about to go off to Agincourt, they sort of beckon him over and say, you know this business where we give you a petition, you answer it, and then we give you money. We've noticed that you have a bad habit of going back and editing these things after we've left. No more of that. Okay? From now on, the petition in the form that you assent to it is the law of the land. And the king says, okay, and goes off and wins a great battle and dies of dysentery. So by now, you've actually got legislation in the modern form coming out of Parliament using the power of the purse 
to control the executive branch. This is all in place, essentially, by 1414. And it's all in place looking backwards. All of this is understood by the people who do it to be an insistence upon their traditional liberties and the creation of new bottles for old wine when new bottles are needed. But all we're saying, that we're going back to Edward the Confessor, we're going back to the good old days, the proper laws we always had. We're just finding new institutional forms to make sure that we don't get a bunch of jiggery pokery coming from the king. And there are things that resemble parliaments in a number of European countries at this point, but we're heading into the age where monarchs establish themselves as more or less absolute. And they break free of any control in Spain, in France, in, in Germany for the most part, kings establish an almost absolute position. And Henry VIII almost does it again. Henry VIII is one of these very scary kings of England. The kind of guy who tells Parliament either, I will have my bill or I will have your heads. And this is not some idle joke in his cups. This is procedure under Henry. And he actually puts before Parliament a statute of proclamations that says the king's word is law. And Parliament says, well, okay, from now on anything the king says is law, Except, if it touches our inheritances, lawful possessions, offices, liberties, privileges, franchises, goods, or chattels, no infringing of any acts, common laws, or lawful and laudable customs of the realm. So apart from that, you can do anything. <laughs> but, as a result, even when Henry's killing his wives to find popes, stealing all the monasteries, and so on, he always goes through Parliament. Never does he dare to try and do something without Parliament. Even Henry, and by the way, I mentioned Henry IV takes over because Richard II gets deposed for being a good architect and a terrible king. Uh, one of the charges against Richard while last seen alive was that he had said the law was, quote, in his mouth. Richard believed that the word of the king was law. And Parliament took this so seriously that they killed him. Happened again to James II. And this means coming out of the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages get a bad rap. I have no idea why. People think they're so much smarter than people were in the Middle Ages because they invented universities and hospitals and we invented gulags and concentration camps. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, of course, at the Tudors fizzle out eventually and you get a, uh, the Stuarts in England who come down from Scotland with very different ideas about government. Um, James I at one point tells Parliament that he, they cannot discuss foreign policy, they do it anyway. He comes down and personally tears the page out of the journal book in which these records are kept. Um, James I was, was a man who did a lot of foolish things but knew when to stop. His son Charles I, of course, didn't, so broke the Civil War, gets himself executed. You get briefly a Commonwealth, and then eventually people say, you know what, this is getting out of hand here. We don't want absolute monarchs, we don't want Puritans and levelers, we just want our liberties back. So they bring back the Stuarts, that doesn't work. 1688, they chase them out again, bring in William of Orange, pass a Bill of Rights. And if you look at the English Bill of Rights from 1688, of course, you see a whole lot of things that are going to turn up in the American Bill of Rights, like the right to bear arms, except in the British case, not the Catholics. <laughs> very dangerous people who should not be permitted to have weapons. Non-Catholic. Uh, nothing, yeah. nothing is perfect. Um, and one of the people that I would like, again, to have a statue on Parliament Hill of, partly because I hadn't even heard of him, it's one of the things that I find difficult about this whole business, even I'm forever making discoveries I should have known, Edward Cook who was uh, Attorney General for Elizabeth I. He's also Speaker of the House of Commons. It's been said that you cannot threaten on your knees. Actually, Cook was good at that. Uh, and, and he would abase himself before Elizabeth I and then tell her that Parliament had privileges she could not meddle with. Um, eventually, uh, under James I, he became uh, Chief Justice of the Court of Common Pleas, that is the, uh, the civil court. Then he became Chief Justice of the Criminal Court. Then he became a political prisoner. Um, didn't get along too well with the king. Uh, wrote a whole bunch of famous commentaries on the laws of England, and finally was released, and in his old age was one of the leaders of the parliamentary movement against Charles I. Also helped write the charter of granting to the pioneers of Jamestown, Virginia, and um, the Virginians, uh, they called it the Great Charter, and they thought of it as a species of Magna Carta, and so did Cook. And Cook always went back to Magna Carta. When he was in doubt as to what the fundamental rules were, he went back to Magna Carta. And so when people are fighting the civil wars of the 17th century in England, they're thinking about Magna Carta not as some interesting historical curiosity, not as some, something of which we eventually evolved something free, but as the cornerstone of their liberty. 
And again, it's worth noticing, Magna Carta is not a law in the sense of a statute passed by Parliament. There was no Parliament at the time. It was a statement of liberties existing from time immemorial, coming from the British people, that could not be infringed, including could not be infringed by Parliament. In this sense, Britain has a constitution like the one the Americans eventually created. It's not as tidy, it's not all in one place, but the idea that there is a law superior to that of Parliament, that there are principles of justice and fair play in government in England that cannot be altered by legislative act is one that to people like Cook was undeniable. One point in Parliament, he's lecturing the king indirectly, he says, Magna Carta is such a uh, fellow as he will have no sovereign. That is, there is no power in England that can change what is in Magna Carta. And when, even when they write the Bill of Rights in 1688, they're thinking of confirming liberties, not creating them. They're thinking of establishing a permanent, clear, and unmistakable record of what these rights are, not of creating them because life was bad without them. And this is a very interesting way of governing yourselves. This is you know, another squeeze, another refinement. And by the time of the, the glorious revolution in England, English Bill of Rights, it is established that the king cannot ignore Parliament. Been there, done that, God beheaded. It's just, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but in the 18th century, something ominous happens. The executive finds another way of going after Parliament that's a great deal more insidious by the proliferation of offices that bring with them rewards when the executive branch is richer. They start to absorb Parliament into the executive branch. And this creates a very real threat to liberties. This is what eventually causes the Americans to panic and create a constitution with a clear separation of powers to make sure that the legislature cannot be absorbed by the executive in a surreptitious manner. And it is very interesting, even in Britain at the time, uh, people who were not insensible of the dangers that the Americans were worried about. Are we in half an hour? The British Parliament, during the American Revolution, during the American Revolution, mind you, in 1780, a famous motion says the influence of the crown has increased, is increasing, and ought to be diminished. And it, it was carried by 233 votes to 215 in Parliament. So the British worried about this too. And in the wake of the American Revolution, you can see that through informal means, the British reduced the power of the crown. They increase the power of Parliament. They all do it on a kind of a gentleman's understanding. And in the end, this will turn out not to be good enough. But the Americans and the British didn't go in hugely different directions. And to the extent that they did, it was the British who veered off. Because when the Americans create a written constitution that says, I am superior to acts of Congress, that's the real spirit of the British constitution. Now, what ends up happening in Britain, by the time you get to Alfred Dicey, he's a very, very acute commentator on Parliament in the 19th century, he says the British Parliament is legally sovereign. The British Parliament, there are laws that might be insane to pass. He says if, if Parliament would pass a law saying all blue-eyed babies had to be executed, this would obviously be crazy and the people would not put up with it. But in a legal sense, it's unimpeachable. There's no court you could go to and say this cannot happen. And that's actually a revolution in the British Constitution, because under any sane reading of Magna Carta, you cannot execute all the blue-eyed babies. And as long as Magna Carta trumped acts of the legislature, therefore, such a law could be fought in court. By the 19th century, uh, you cannot do this. And this, is, this creates a real crisis, but it's, it's a subtle sleeper, because the British Parliament in the early Victorian period doesn't do things like that. Britain's government gets smaller in this period. Liberties in Britain are respected. and. The fact that Parliament might run amok seems a very remote danger, especially with the memories of the American Revolution. In Canada, we get our almost comic opera rebellion in 1837, and the British Parliament and Lord Durham, their reaction is, we better give them self-government, otherwise they're going to march, march off on us. The reaction is not, let's crack down on them. They don't try and do what Lord North tried to do to the Americans. But the... British Constitution by now has been subtly destroyed. The old British Constitution is gone, except in the United States. Um, and we're in a kind of peculiar position by this point, because in 1867 we were given a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom. It says so in the BNA. 
But there are two obvious ways in which this is not true. One, we have a written constitution that overrides our parliament, which the British don't. And two, we have a federal system, which the British don't. So there's something odd about this, which I'll come back to in a moment. But first, I want to emphasize that the people who made Canada were steeped in the British tradition of liberty. They read Locke. They read uh, Jean-Louis Delon, now forgotten, but a great commentator on the British Constitution in 1775, his book, The Constitution of England. is a marvelous read. I very much recommend it. But w when Canada was founded, John A. Macdonald said, the rights of the minority must be protected, and the rich are always fewer than the poor. Macdonald understood the British system as protecting rights of minorities. Well, if Parliament is absolutely sovereign, it's not clear how this is going to happen. So there's a bit of a disconnect between what he thinks the British system does and what by now it's at least capable of doing. And Macdonald said, in all countries, the rights of the majority take care of themselves. It is only in countries like England enjoying constitutional liberty and safe from the tyranny of a single despot or of an unbridled democracy that the rights of minorities are regarded. Now, why does Macdonald think that Britain is not an unbridled democracy? By now, constitutionally, Britain is. A majority can elect a parliament that can do anything, and there's no way of stopping it. Uh, and um, Macdonald is not the only one. Um, Richard Cartwright uh, was speaking in the United Province of Canada in 1865, and after talking about the need to protect the rights of the minority, he says, for myself, sir, I own frankly, I prefer British liberty to American equality. The notion is that the British Constitution, not the American one, establishes rights and freedoms that are not subject to the will of the legislature. And the only way this can happen, really, is if Magna Carta is still operating, otherwise the legislature can do anything. And Wilfrid Laurier, by the way, he, among the many things he said that would not be likely to be said today, Canada is free and freedom is its nationality. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting, isn't it? Um, that's where Laurier refers to that good old Anglo-Saxon word freedom. Okay. Try, try that today. Um, <laughs> but you, know, you get a lot of people who tell you, oh, no, Canada's formed from the fusion of the English and the French, or you know, Canada had no freedom until the charter came along. This, this is a very strange reading of the situation in Canada itself after 1867, and utterly and completely preposterous in light of this longer history. The notion that the French absolute monarchs who colonized New France contributed anything useful to our political system or anything noticeable to our political system is just weird. What habit coming out of absolutist France can you identify in our ways of making law? It's true. The, um, existence of, of the civil code in Quebec rather than common laws is certainly a very big legal difference. But the way that the civil code works in Quebec is like the way the common law worked in England. It's actually fair. It's not like things were under Louis XIV, and it, I don't know how anybody could see otherwise. Um, now, by the way, I quoted Laurier there. I also like to quote Louis Saint Laurent. In, in 1957, federal election, Saint Laurent said, any ideas of non-essential interference by the government is repugnant to the Liberal Party. Uh, right afterward, a former Saskatchewan Premier, Federal Liberal Finance Minister Charles Dunning, argued against an expansive social agenda. He said that and more and more social programs would create, and I quote, a tremendous and expensive machine to bring about redistribution of wealth by taxation and lessening the responsibility on the part of the individual citizen, and by doing so are decreasing both the dignity and freedom of the individual person. I know it may not sound like practical politics to be flashing this kind of red light, but surely we liberals must get back to fundamental thinking in terms of principles. So that's within the lifetime of a number of the people, at least at this table, that the liberals talk that way. I was two. I couldn't vote. No, but you see, <laughs> God, I'd be a liberal. The, the idea that <laughs> Canada was not founded on liberty, that these ideas are alien to Canada, is a piece of historical legere domain that shouldn't be put up with. Again, Stuart Campbell, speaking in the Nova Scotia Assembly in 1869, said, I am a free man. I claim the rights and attributes of a free man, speaking in the presence of a British free assembly. I would love to hear somebody say that in Parliament today. William Lawrence in the Nova Scotia House of Assembly in 1866. We are a free people, prosperous beyond doubt, advancing cautiously in wealth. Under the British Constitution, we have far more freedom than any people on the face of the earth. 
In Newfoundland in 1869, George Hogsett said, We have here a constitution for which the people nobly fought and which was reluctantly wrung from the British government. We had the right of taxing ourselves, of legislating for ourselves. So we we'll go right back to 1297, de non concedendo. That's where Canada came from. That's Canada's story, and there's no substitute story that makes any sense. I mean, as you know, Pierre Trudeau, when he brought in the Charter, thought he was safeguarding individual rights. The problem is he was sort of a lousy cook, and what he came up with didn't taste like what he said it was going to, and he just never, never grasped this. Um, <coughs> Britain, in Britain, by the way, this is all gone to bits now. They've surrendered their sovereignty to the European Union. But when they asked the British, we needed a day. We need a day for Britain. What should we commemorate? Magna Carta won. The Magna Carta Day is what they picked. Extraordinary, but there's a lot of ruin in a nation. And this has run into a lot of parts of the world. For instance, um, the Prime Minister of India planted a commemorative oak tree at Runnymede in March 1994, and he said it was a tribute to the historic Magna Carta, a source of inspiration throughout the world, and an affirmation of the values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, which the people of India cherish and have enshrined in their constitution. The Americans have never forgotten this. The world, New York World's Fair, uh, New York newspaper called it the ever-living fountain from which flow those liberties which the English world enjoys today. George Bush, uh, in, in Brussels in February 2005, talked to, said the American Constitution traces back to Magna Carta, which is the uh, author of this book on Magna Carta that I'm reading, said presumably annoyed the European uh, bureaucrats. But the fact of the matter is that Europe doesn't derive its political institutions from Magna Carta. And if Europeans really want to be free, they have got to repair a spider web that they don't have. You know, some parts of Western Europe have some traditions that make a difference, even France. Other parts, they are, they are trying to come up with this from nothing. They're trying to look at what somebody else did and say, how do we do that? And when they do that, they're not just looking at institutions. They're looking at cultural habits that are very hard to acquire. Whereas in England, this business when William the Conqueror says, I'll observe the laws of Edward the Confessor. When John talks about that, even though people know that these two are not honest men, and that they are talking under duress, and they are talking about both sides of their mouths, why is the propaganda useful? Because people believe in it, they expect one another to believe in it, and they will rise up in mutual support if something happens to this. And these are habits that don't exist in other places, and it makes it very hard for them to stop misgovernment. Uh, I don't know if any of you know John Patrick, he's a, a doctor and a Christian activist, uh, but he had used this example of Israel being reassembled after 1800 plus years of the diaspora. He said, why were Israelis, why could the Jews put their nation back together? He said, because through all those generations of exile, at the table, as they are told to do, they told their children their story. And then he says, can you imagine trying to reassemble Canadians after 1800 years based on the charter? <laughs> no, I can't. But I can imagine it based on Magna Carta and on Alfred the Great and the story of Alfred and the Cake. It's not quite 1800 years, but it's over a thousand to Alfred. It'll do. That's a long, long time. And you go through this story and you find point after point where our political ancestors, it's nothing to do with where you're from or what you look like. It's a matter of being part of a political tradition that stretches back into Anglo-Saxon England. Our ancestors banded together on the notion that every free man should enjoy the rule of law and that there were things that no government could do under any circumstances because it didn't have the permission of the people to do them. And this wasn't just a theory, it was a cultural understanding embodied in a set of institutions. Now, how we get this back today is not clear to me, because in fact, the problem that people saw in the 18th century has happened. We have had a fusion of the upper reaches of the legislature, the executive, the cabinet, not the monarch, of course, but also the upper reaches of the public service into a kind of fourth branch of government that is not described in our constitution, which incidentally, if you look at our constitution, it has a separation of powers, just like the American one. It lays out the three branches, and then the, it talks about the provinces. And, of course, our constitution, it was like the British constitution in the sense that what it mostly did, what was fenced off from government action, wasn't liberties as in the American setup. It was the rights of the provinces. Because the Confederation deal couldn't have happened if, the pro if Quebec in particular had not been promised that a majority in the federal parliament couldn't alter the rules. And that's why people complained, oh, it was an act of the British parliament, how demeaning. It was an act of the British parliament so the Canadian parliament couldn't change it. 
And of course, when Trudeau patriated the Constitution, he created an amending formula nobody could operate. So again, Quebec would not fear that someone would change the rules of, feder of the Federation, which was a, a reasonable practical thing, but it's an embarrassing theoretical one. We have a Constitution you cannot now deal with because you can't change it. It's just not workable. At least not in, in a technical kind of way, but I think that there's hope here. And the reason I think there's hope is because of the fact that our story goes back through Magna Carta to Alfred the Great and to the mists of time, and that this is the only story about Canada that really makes any sense. This is where we get our rule of law. This is where we get our individual rights. This is where we get our parliamentary institutions with their often obscure looking rituals. But they all come out of a story of how it is that the rights of the people as individuals cooperating for their mutual protection could not be taken away by the government. There's no other story about Canada that you can tell that has any resonance. There's a line of C.S. Lewis in the uh, second of the Narnia Chronicles. Uh, comments that the sort of history that was taught in Narnia under the tyrant Miraz's rule was duller than the truest history you ever read and less true than the most exciting adventure story. And I often feel that way about the substitute version of history that we're taught. It is at one and the same time preposterously dull and absolutely untrue. The fact is that we come from Magna Carta. And we should be proud of this and we should restore the story of Alfred and the Cakes by telling it at the dinner table. The story of Canute, these things that I talked about, about Edward I and De Tellagio, about how Parliament gets, the House of Commons sits separately, gets its control of its own affairs, tells the king he can't meddle with their petitions, and uh, that he must grant them what they want before they're going to give him any money, and that the unelected upper house, for all its many uses, cannot take a primary role when it comes to taxing people. All of this is what makes us what we are if we are anything. But Winston Churchill in 1956 talking about Australia um, so talking about Magna Carta, he said, the facts embodied in it and the circumstances giving rise to them were buried or misunderstood. The underlying idea of the sovereignty of the law long existing in feudal custom was raised by it into a doctrine for the national state. And when in subsequent ages the state, swollen with its own authority, has attempted to ride roughshod over the rights or liberties of the subject, it is to this doctrine that appeal has again and again been made and never as yet without success. And indeed, you find people in the, in the 19th century in England, people who are protesting and on the verge of rioting, are talking about Magna Carta as the basis for what they're doing. So this thing from 1215 through into the 19th century was something people would wave like a placard. And why on earth should we not do that now? Why should we not say our rights come from this document and they, it is a living document? And everything since is a story of what grew out of Magna Carta, out of the, this great trunk, these are the branches, these are the leaves, these are the fruits, but it all goes back to Magna Carta. And if you try to cut through anywhere above Magna Carta, this thing dies. We have no system of government, we have no political culture that protects freedom if we do not use Magna Carta as the touchstone. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. You know, let's say we're talking about restoring liberty one cake at a time. Mm -hmm. Telling the story, making the argument, drawing the connection. Of course it's going to be hard work. Of course we're going to have a lot of frustrations, but we have that anyway. You know, nobody <laughs> said the job would be easy. But we have the right to take our country back. Because Magna Carta is the foundation of all of it, and we should not be embarrassed to say so. I've got somewhere less than a thousand questions. Yeah. That's <laughs> so do we. The, yeah. If this is our basis of law, the Magna Carta Bill of Rights, uh, that were these were brought into the body of the entire body of English law became part of Canadian law with the BNA Act. Correct. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not clear on all the history. How do we then stop our government from passing what are patently unconstant patent? Uh, passing and enforcing what are patently unconstitutional and illegal laws. Well, you see, the thing I think you start with is by getting people to understand what law is, what it's for, or where it came from. I mean, that doesn't help you much in a piece of litigation, though I would love to see somebody try to argue a case based on Magna Carta. 
Um, you literally just bring it in and say, well, no, this, is, this has never been superseded. You cannot show me an act where Magna Carta is repealed. Therefore, it's still in force, and this is what it says. Uh, but, you, you know, you cannot fight an enemy or his outpost in your head. And I think the first point is to get more and more Canadians to understand that the kind of government we have today is alien to our tradition. You know, people say, oh, you're talking like an American. They say, no, I'm not. I'm talking like a Canadian. The Americans were fortunate enough to get it as well, and more power to them, but this is Canada's story, and I want it back. Um, and, and one of the things I always wonder is, what would happen if we tried to repeal the Constitution Act of 1982? I mean, if Parliament can do anything, why can't it do that? What would the legal status be if we did that? But isn't that what Trudeau said was protected and not allowed to touch? But by what, right? But if you repeal the Act, the fact that the Act says it can't be repealed, does that still operate? So put pressure on the government to repeal it. It would be, an, it'd be one way of going about it, but at least get people talking about, well, if we really wanted to amend our Constitution, if we decided that our Constitution was unsatisfactory in principle, what could we do? The people cannot make law. Parliament cannot make law. Who can make law in this? Who can make fundamental law in this country? A, a, a parliament that hasn't sat in 27 years? How did they acquire the power to make a law no one could change? I don't, I don't see how this could happen. I see nothing in the legal powers of that parliament when it was formed that enable it to pass this act. No parliament can bind its successor. This was a principle in British law for hundreds of years. How did the parliament in 1984 bind all its successors? I don't, I don't see this. More importantly, why does everyone keep saying we can't touch it, we can't touch it? Let's why? try and see what happens. Maybe. <laughs> Most politicians are lawyers. Right? So are they familiar with these concepts or do so. they are they ignorant or do they know it but poo poo them i'm trying to understand because mm -hmm. our family's involved in a legal thing right now family law thing and we're just seeing judge after judge who seems oblivious <coughs> to their fundamental principles and we want bills for that so really what makes them tick well i would say you know in order to be as fair as i can you could ask them Ask a politician who's a lawyer, what do you think of Edward Cook? See if they have anything to say. What's your favorite part of Magna Carta? See if they know anything that's in it. Well, and, and it'll be no. Probably not. So then the answer is that they're ignorant. And if they're ignorant, you can inform them, which is better than the alternatives, right? If but, someone is willfully ignoring it, you've got a worse problem. But that's pretty dangerous, these people of such power who are, in fact, oblivious. And then when us who learn approach them and they we get a whole right? <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah. And this is why I say, t tell your children, teach the story. You know, I, when I teach university, I make sure that my class hears about this. 90% of them probably don't remember it, but the other 10% do, and they go out and they tell people. And they say, I can't believe no taxation without representation comes from 1297. Did you know that? And if it comes from 1297, it's not an American idea, so we're, we're allowed to have it. <laughs> <laughs> have you written a book on this subject? I'm working on one. Oh, good. 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 Sorry, no. Very briefly, is it possible to audit your course? Uh, I have no objection. I think you're allowed to. The, well, the next course I'm teaching is the history of the Cold War. So, I, <laughs> this mostly comes up with the American History Surveys, but I do uh, they do let me teach those from time to time. John, I got a question for you. You mentioned how uh, Magna Carta or British Common Law was really how, before there was a formal Parliament, was a, a gathering of local people, and that uh, magistrates were there and they would make the law, not the executive or not the king. What's to stop, you talk about how do we bring it back, what's to stop a bunch of people in a geographical area in Canada from literally sitting down and making their own laws according to Magna Carta? Well, the problem is that in Henry II's day, what they were doing was discovering law, not making it. They would, the judge would go and ask people, what is the law? They would say, it's always been like this. The problem is, the law we have now, from a legal point of view, is the Act of Parliament. Um, and as long as a Parliament can do anything, that is the law. And you need to change that in order to stop Parliament from doing the things you don't want it to do. We've, we've lost the legal moorings. So as I, I was saying, maybe if someone tried a court challenge based on the fact that someone had transgressed Magna Carta and demanded that the other side prove, show when Magna Carta had been repealed, you might... <laughs> You might have nothing to lose. The man's never been tried. I'm not going to pay your legal bills. I, I don't know, but I didn't know what I I have a question. Uh, you said that you had hope 
But if only 15% of people across Canada pay even a slight bit of attention to politics, where is your hope coming from? Exactly. Yeah. Well, if only 15% pay attention, you only have to persuade 8%. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, but, but again, it's because stories are powerful. And these are great stories. The story of Alfred and the Cakes is a tearjerker, right? I mean, yeah. you tell it on property and your audience will dissolve. The story, Edward Cook, I, it was somebody just sent me a letter uh, because of my, my writing my column and said, do you know about Edward Cook? And I said, no. They said, would you like me to send you a biography of Edward Cook? Mm -hmm. Sure, why not? It's called The Lion and the Throne. And I, read, I was enthralled. I was, well, here's one of the stories about Cook. When he was head of um, the uh, criminal court, and James I likes to have his ecclesiastical courts take over cases so he could dictate outcomes. And Cook kept issuing writs saying if a case has civil implications, the ecclesiastical courts can't have it. And finally the king got so mad that he summoned Cook and threatened him with terrible things. And the scene played itself out with Cook on his face on the floor in front of the king and the king's most powerful advisors who liked Cook on bended knees saying, please spare him, spare him. And finally the king said, get him out of my sight. And Next day the king went off hunting, Cook went back to his courtroom and issued another writ, forbidding an ecclesiastical court to take cognizance. I mean, dare we chicken out when he did that? Mm -hmm. here, here. Uh, can I uh, Google uh, Magna Carta? Oh God, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, and don't Google Edward Cook at the same time. It's, it's spelled Cook, but it's pronounced Cook. I have a question for you. You mentioned there's a number of, of versions of, of the Magna Carta. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, so, which one do you actually, is the original basically, do you, do you think the original one is the, 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 the Holy Grail sort of thing, or? Really, the 1225 version is the one that's stuck. The Great Charter. But it doesn't have this thing about the common consent of the kingdom, which, which took anyway. Uh -huh. um, but part of it, the, the original one had this committee of barons to supervise the king. And this was so alien to British law that it perished. Right. Uh, so 1225 is the one they have in the British Library. Um, they have a copy they found at a tailor's shop in the 17th century and put on display. You, you mentioned some, just now what, the consent of the common. Right? I mean, some notes here. Uh, in Henry II, the English citizens consent to be governed. So, are we we're giving consent to our? Yeah, but but under Henry II, it wasn't through a parliament. It was because Henry was a, a great developer of the common law. He sent his judges out, and they found out what the law was. And the law was whatever rules the people of England, generally speaking, had been willing to live under. So they created the law not through legislation, but uh, the, the courts discovered what the rules were under which Englishmen lived. And so funnily enough, in, in a way, that the law comes from the, from the sovereign people through the courts. It doesn't come from the legislature, but the judges aren't making the law, they're discovering the law. So it's very different than what they do today. We've gone past that. Oh, horribly. Long time. Horribly. But still, the consent to be governed, is that still one of the fundamental tenets? Well, I say it is. And, and yet, it's hard to find in the Canadian goodness. Parliament. Um, and even Dicey writing in the 19th century says, technically, the British people are, are politically sovereign, but legally it's Parliament. In a legal sense, the British Parliament could sit forever and do anything it wanted. It could refuse to have another election. Um, so the British have an odd system. There's no formal popular sovereignty as in the United States. But when you look at documents like Magna Carta, there was formal popular sovereignty in Britain until sometime, really, in the reign of Queen Victoria. Um, a few questions. Uh, first one, you, you mentioned something about the civil code in Quebec. When did it become called the Code de Napoleon? When Napoleon came in to relative uh, anything valid 30 or 40 years after Quebec proceeded to England? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That's an answer. Uh, it seems to me that what we have to do is, I've actually thought maybe one of the best things we could do to, to sort of get the Parliament back to being responsible to the people is only have Parliament sit maybe two months of the year and force the representatives to stay in their writings and face the wrath of the people. Uh, let's face it, if you've got people screaming in your face every day going, well, what, what are you doing stepping all over my property here? Uh, we'd have changed real quick. What do you think about the idea of, of making Parliament, I mean, they're not there six months of the year now and they're on our dime. Why don't we at least get to scream at them for ten months of the year on our dime? Well, the problem with that is that right now, law in Canada, both, both legislation and regulation, are, are generated by the upper echelon of bureaucracy in combination with cabinet, and Parliament just rubber stamps them. For instance, this rule, the, the parliamentary committees are meant to look at the estimates for the budget in their area, but the rule is that if they don't look at them by 
what are the date is, I think it's the end of May, they're assumed to have approved them. So, of course, the committees don't bother looking at these things. Um. So the budgets just whoosh through. Then they're passing these enormous omnibus acts that nobody's read. Yeah. What I would like to do is actually the opposite. I would like to double the size of Parliament. I would like to have 600 plus MPs, most of whom are never going to make it into cabinet and cannot be enticed with parliamentary secretaryships, and ministers of state. More than almost half the Tory caucus has some kind of cabinet related title, and there's extra pay that comes with that. I would like to see uh, a parliament in which there are disgruntled backbenchers by the millions. <laughs> and I would give every MP ten times the budget they have now. MPs operate with four staff. They've got no idea what's going on. Two of them are back in the riding dealing with constituents. One's handling the email, and one's doing all the policy. I would like MPs to have 30 staff, people who are well-paid experts following issues, so when the MP gets a bill in front of him, they've got somebody who knows what they're talking about and says this is a bad bill. I would like to have MPs hanging around bothering the executive branch full time. Uh, because they're, they're just unable to do that now, and that's why the executive has turned into this weird fourth branch. Are you familiar with the, uh, the uh, what we call it the sovereignty movement, individual sovereignty movement, freedom on the land thing that seems to be growing across North America? Yeah, it, it doesn't work. Right? You have to have governments to provide for the common defense. The, the, if you don't have that, the Danes invade and burn everything. <laughs> uh, we, we need government. Government is essential to, to do that, to enforce certain weights and measures are in Magna Carta, so it's too equitable. Uh, a criminal code, that kind of thing, stop fugitives from the law. There are very real things government needs to do. But it should concentrate on those and not be worried about how much salt we have. You know, they just got rid of their sodium advisory group, and then I think it was the Globe and an editorial saying, oh no, we need a sodium advisory group. <laughs> For crying out loud, I can control how much salt there is in my food. You worry about the Navy having ships. <laughs> <laughs>
And he, he, he was like, wait, charge me. Please charge me so I can fight this. And uh, so finally he got his day in court, and I, I, I get the impression that the case was probably not well structured, and the judge sort of let it go with, well, you haven't made your case, and I'm not going to rule. And it just seems that the courts are very carefully choosing either not to charge certain people and not to rule on, on this, and yet we continue to have the Canadian Firearms Act, which on its surface is not only illegal by old tra tradition, it violates the charter in no less than 14 points. Well, certainly confiscating without charging, obviously Magna Carta doesn't permit that, right? It lays out that there will be due process of law, and this sort of thing can't happen. But it the does. other thing, again, you look at the story of liberty, right? I mean, why does Alfred... Why is Alfred able to do what he does? Why? Because he can summon the common people of England to come with their weapons and beat off the Danes. How do you get Magna Carta? By armed rebellion against King John. How do you get rid of Charles I? You know, the landmarks of our liberty right up to 1837, whether I admit it's comic opera, but it is, this, it is this possibility of a popular uprising that the crown could not defeat by force, as happened in the American colonies in the, in, starting in 1776, that makes the British government give us self-government. Now, luckily, we haven't needed it since then, and there's no immediate prospect that we will. But if you look at the structure of Canadian liberties as a story that's more than a thousand years old, it is obvious that the ability of citizens to defend themselves is a key component of our rights. It, this is it, part of popular our, sovereignty. And yet our, our government is actively trying to disarm the citizenry. Well, the government's trying to do a lot dangerous. of things to us, right? They're, uh, they're, they're working on a tax on soda, so you can't drink an unhealthy beverage. Again, we're all happy that King John drank unhealthy beverages. But, you know, it, it's part of a, a larger thing of trying to say, we have been given a false story about who we are, and the idea that Canada is the place where people's, the government bosses us around, you know, and this is what makes us great, is that we have a big intrusive government. If you cannot combat that story, you're not going to win the little battles. If you can defeat that, then you're going to be in good shape. Because again, the, the Charter does promise due process of law. And, and again, you can see, even though the Charter obviously in many ways is not a well-written document, there are clear lines from Magna Carta through to the Charter. And again, I think the argument needs to be made, without Magna Carta there can be no Charter. And the ways in which the Charter is incompatible with Magna Carta are ways in which it is not a, uh, even a coherent document. That the, the Charter promises more than there is to people. It says that we can change the conditions of life in ways the state cannot do, and by doing things that are incompatible with other parts of the Charter and with the tradition of liberty. Well, he's trying to get it handled based on our Charter rights and freedoms, but they are, they've denied him to switch from a JP to a real judge. And as no, long as the JP's actually, there, he's been there. Oh? Uh, actually, he, he's been allowed to... to they have? Yeah. Oh, they've allowed, allowed I mean, again, I, I, I can't comment on the details yeah, of the case. They don't have legal training, but, but there just, are... The Ontario fair government play. seems to be treading all over I would like to bring up something about that. Some of you are probably aware of the fact that the Senate has just approved the Consumer Product Protection Act, Bill oh, C-36. Yeah. And the nice thing about Bill C-36 is that A, they don't need warrants, B, they can seize property, there's a good chance you will not get it back anymore. And, and, and there's no recourse to the court. So I mean, basically, we this is a frontal assault on property rights. Yeah. Mm. This is Ontario? And yes. yes. This is federal. This is federal. This will and, be and again, federal. If you want to win this argument, you have to persuade at least the 15% or more. You have to want to say, what kind of country are we? Who are we as Canadians? Does this question have any answer? And if you give him Laurier's answer, I mean, A, you, you guard yourself against the charge of partisanship because he's, uh, he's a liberal. So Canada is free and freedom is its nationality. Well then, and can this happen to a free people? Because if you don't frame it that way, uh, you're, you're fighting a rearguard action on the details, I mean, which is, of course, if you're in court, you have to. But uh, the, the broader thing is to, is to come back again. Imagine if you could get a statue of Alfred on Parliament Hill. You know, <laughs> what, what would be what, the, the kind of change in the way people think that would require that? Uh, and, and having a label that says, this is Alfred of Wessex and why he's here. Um, that would, that would be the kind of thing that would start to change the climate. Ideas matter. People are logical slowly, but they are logical, and we when need to change the logic. I'm oh, sorry. When, when did Alfred reign? He was king from 876 to, gosh, I think 899. Uh, well, so he was dealing with the Danes a lot. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. He, got, oh, he, uh, he took back London, and he forced his main enemy to convert to Christianity.
he, uh, he, 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 well, and John, he had, well, it was yeah, John, the problem now is if you got, if you got a picture <laughs> of Alfred, <laughs> if you got a picture of Alfred the Great up there, people are going to look at it. Unfortunately, this is a sad, my sad belief in a lot of people going, gee, when did he play for the Senators? <laughs> there will, there will be is that Alfredson? Wow, where's the crowd come from? They can explain. I mean, what can you do? Like, there's a great statue of Laurier on Parliament Hill, and no one ever sees it because he's facing the train station. They put it there before the automobile. You know, just, I mean, uh, that, that brings up my personal bugaboo. I was a terrible student, I freely admit it. I had a 50.1 when I graduated from high school. I was socially promoted. But as Jacques Parizeau says, 50.1 is a majority. However, when it comes to education, it's not a pass. But with me, it was a case of I just sat there like the inert lump that I was because I couldn't stand being there. I was bored. I believe our education system now is systematically dumbing people down oh, on yeah. purpose. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. That it's being done on purpose mm -hmm. because the, the easier to re, to lead the lump and masses wherever you want when they can't even actually put two and two together. As one of my rules, never ascribe to a conspiracy what can be explained by stupidity. You're a an expert on the American Constitution or American history. I'm an American historian by training. So. The American um, Declaration of Independence. Would you? Is that really just an affirmation of the principles of the Magna Carta? The Constitution more than the Declaration. The Declaration Jefferson got carried away. Um, just sort of like we're pissed off. But we're but there was, there's an interesting example. During the Revolution, there was a battle. I forget it was over some very obscure bay where two obscure commanders were fighting, and the British commander issued an appeal to the people and said, "Inhabitants." cling to British liberty, enjoy your freedoms under the ancient constitution, rally to Mother England. And the American guy came in and said, citizens, enjoy your British liberty, cling to your ancient <laughs> freedoms, rally to our cause. And it was just, because it wasn't, they, they weren't dictated to a stonemason, they were just in the middle of an emergency. The fact that they both put the issue that way, yeah, it makes it very clear what the political appeal was. It's which of us has the ancient constitution is gonna win this thing. Um, and, uh, and again, as I say, the, the British constitution was, pulled back into shape to some extent by the shock of the American Revolution. Uh, but it wasn't given the formal hardness of the American Constitution. And what this meant is that over 100 years, especially the changes in the early 20th century, coming out of parliamentary sovereignty meant that the thing was able to be uh, crumbled by, from within. Uh, it's very tragic. I mean, what, what happened to Britain? I don't understand. Oh, really? a great, I walk oh. around London depresses me because it's the heart of a great nation, but where are the limbs? Very good. Well, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, just just a quickie. Uh, when I Google Coke, Go which Coke is it? It's Edward. It's spelled Coke like the drink. It's just people don't talk about it much because they think it's Coke. It's, it's pronounced Coke, but it's spelled C O K E. And uh, again, it, it is one of the just forgotten heroes of our history. Edward, Edward Cook. Cook. C O K E. C -O -K -E. That's Lord Edward Coke. <coughs> Um, no, yeah, I always I, see that name, the word Lord. Yeah, I think he eventually was, was made a Lord. Yeah. Uh, I, have a, I have a question for you. Um, just, um, um, I'm the president of the Ontario Land Owners Association, and one of the initiatives we're pushing forward are, are Crown Land patents. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're, one of the things we're asking landowners who have been charged to, to use in court. What would happen if they if used the Magna Carta in... in, in uh, in Gordon with the Crown Land patent, do you think that would have more um, uh, authority? You know, uh, the, I have to preface it by I've heard of this Crown Land patent okay. thing, but I don't know enough about it to comment. Okay. Uh, I think bringing Magna Carta into court is always a good idea. Yes. But uh, beyond that, my ignorance is uh, indefeasible on the subject of what might happen next, because I just, okay. I, I'm, I've been meaning to look into them, but I just, I've been busy with her second. Okay, well, I, I could, I could if, um, I'll give you my card, you can give me your card, and I, I would definitely send you some I'd appreciate that, because I do okay. have my yeah. um, Very briefly, John, um, is it possible to, to get a copy of your notes from today? I should explain. I do not. Uh, I do not write up a speech and then read it. I I compile research and I talk about what I've discovered. So yeah, yeah. this would be unrecognizable. But yeah, that'll be that'll be up on uh, YouTube, and I'm going to put it. And if anyone's got high speed, I'm going to be putting this yeah. in my Dropbox on my computer. Yeah. I will oh, send okay. out the link, and then you can download it yourself, okay. and you can have it, and you can hand it. One other thing. Do you have? ideas or suggestions about how we can start to reclaim some of the Well, yeah, again, it's, it's by reclaiming our story. 
And I know that that might seem like a feeble roundabout way, but ideas matter more than anything else in the long run. And the problem we have is that the people out there don't know the story. Because when they hear it, it normally it appeals to people. I mean, you can't win them all, right? But uh, the fact of the matter is that people have been cut off from the story. So they heard it and didn't agree with it. They haven't heard it. And when you tell them this is who you are, I mean, in a way it's daunting. You walk in the uh, footsteps of heroes. Again, Edward Cook. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a bit scary. How am I going to live up to Edward Cook? But on the other hand, how can I not try? How could I, and, and I, you know, in, in our grandfather's time, these are stories, when the Canadians who went to fight World War I, they all knew these stories in a much better way than we do. They could have rattled off half the history of England in their sleep. And they knew what they were fighting for. And we, th so this is, this is our tradition. We just have to take it back, which is a lot easier than starting from scratch. Uh, but it really does come out of saying, I know who you are, and your story starts with Alfred, a, a great man, an inspiring figure, of, and again, a daunting figure, but let's be daunted. You're only, you're only alive once. Make the most of it. Have you read Pierre Teilhard de Chardin's works? No. Uh, it, they're very relevant to, to what you've talked about today. He lived until 1955, and he um, took the old Plato concept of a, Noos, a noocracy, a noosphere the mass self-consciousness of man. And he wrote about it in 1955 or so that he died. But it, that concept, uh, uh, really, just in one, one sentence, it, it amounts to uh, a, the mass self-consciousness of mankind showing empathy for your fellow man. And it generates freedom. But anyway. I just, just brought this up. John, I just, uh, sorry. Uh, John, John Adams, the American president, who I'm beginning to think now is equal to and quite possibly is a legal draftsman superior to Lincoln, once wrote that America would be a land of laws, not of men. Is, is he sort of echoing Magna Carta in that a, an organic concept of the law that everyone is included, no one's excluded, just by the fact that the law is not, in essence, man-made by one person. Yeah, I mean, you, you've caught me without my John Adams quotations, but Adams... I'll have you back. I mean, if you look at what Adams said about the British common law, the greatest contrivance uh, for liberty in history, Adams was absolutely looking back to this legacy. So, yeah, there, there's no doubt when he talked like that, he was thinking about British, the British story, and he was thinking about it explicitly. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was in the forefront of his mind. You know, and, and, I mean, he read... Um, Locke and he read Blackstone. They they very much were aware of this kind of thing and they took it very seriously. How much do you think of the of the what Alfred brought about? I know, as you say, he taught he, taught, he learned Latin himself. He made sure all of his commanders, all of the people he sent out to rule as England started to expand what we know as England, so he could send out the king's laws and they could read it. And here's what the king said: This is what you will do. How much do you think of as he read Latin? He probably read Cicero and a lot of, in, of what Romans called natural laws there. It was so obvious the Romans didn't even put it down in their books. And that English common law is a natural extension of the Roman law, that this is so obvious we're not even going to bother putting it in. And yet it just sort of permeated out through in, in day to day life, like don't steal my pig, I won't steal yours. Yeah, well, and obviously, don't, I mean, don't forget, Alfred was a Christian, so to him, there's a law that comes from God, which is superior to man's law, and the job of, of human law is to discover, in so far as possible, what divine law is and try to obey it. Uh, Cicero realized this thing existed, but he couldn't explain where it came from. Uh, but, but to Alfred, there's no question, yeah, that, that, that right and wrong cannot be determined by a vote of human beings. Uh, how we're going to try to implement what we think of as right and wrong is, is a technical question, but the idea that there's a law written on the human heart that everybody knows and it's the same for everybody is inseparable from Alfred's Christianity, so he would unquestionably have thought that. Another question, okay. So, the British common tradition came through a very, very much oh. talkative people on developing things. I always consider the American Constitution to come more from the British philosophers like Locke and stuff you touched on Locke there. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I think the American Constitution came from a different tradition, more the philosophical tradition as opposed to the common knowledge tradition. Well, 
in, in a way it did, but the Americans were reading Locke and this sort of thing in order to understand the tradition of liberty that they had inherited. They were not. Says that he was the biggest influence on Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, and I mean, I'm uh, Jefferson to me is a bit of a villain actually. Uh, I'm, I'm not a Jefferson fan. His uh, his stand on slavery and that kind of thing was uh, was just absolutely beneath contempt. But. Um, <clears throat> The, I mean, Locke is the great theorist of the glorious revolution. So again, and Locke is talking about principles that seem to him to be embedded in the English tradition. I do know, I know what I didn't read, but um, from a book the Heritage Foundation just put out, uh, Gertrude Himmelfarb actually did look at the sources the American founding fathers quote, and said it had almost nothing to do with the kind of philosophy that they were reading in France. Um, the most referenced work was the Bible. 34%. The next, 22%, is dominated basically by Locke, Montesquieu, and Blackstone. So that's who they're reading, and that's who they're citing. That's who they think has got their finger on what's going on. And this to them is not abstract theory. It's an explanation of evolved practice. And, and again, when, when the, to the American founding fathers, the story of the struggle against the Stuarts and so on is, is part of their history. They see themselves as another chapter of Charles I, and that George III is just doing a more subtle version of what the Stuarts tried to do. Uh, so to them, this is living history, and they're part of a story. And uh, again, I think they write, and I think we're part of that story, and I think it's, an, it's a great story. Uh, we just better be sure we play a worthy role in it, because, uh, you know, dropping the torch into a puddle is ignominious. Uh, you were you're mentioning that uh, all we need to do is uh, get 50% of the people involved. Actually, only 3% of the population are politically active, the rest just follow. But they've got to follow based on understanding yeah, what's happening. You need to get the story out more broadly. And again, as I say, the, the, the idea that you say to young people, you walk in the footsteps of heroes. And some of these people lived 500 years ago, but it doesn't make them any less heroic. You know, what, again, what, what is offered to young people today from the other side? Environmental. Not much, right? Don't bring a baggie to school. Um, <laughs> oh, I read that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that we, we have a better story. Out our history. And I'm, I mean, our story is a better story, partly because it's true, and truth is, is <laughs> not a lot. Um, it, it's a more exciting story, and, and the idea of things that happened. And, and the improbability of it, and the courage that it took, and the inventiveness, you know, how, how do you lose it when you've got this to tell? Is there, in this museum across the river, the civilization, or whatever, is there anything in there about Canadian lottery? I'm nothing that I'm aware of. But, yeah. <laughs> that, be, that be, might be a place to start. No, I mean, the is, is, is inconvenient for our current government. Yeah, yeah it is. It I, is. I, I, I know. know. I know when I was when I was in high school, I I, I studied the Magna Carta, but it was, I mean, so basic. I mean, all I could tell you about it was that, that it was a document, yeah. uh, something to do with yeah. the Saxons, and that's yeah. about it. Yeah. Mm. The nobles revolted okay. against the king and made him sign his charter. <laughs> that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 yeah, Even in the movies, uh, the last uh, Robin Hood movie, that's that's what they say. Yeah, yeah. they got him to sign this, and and. From what you're saying here, now that's that's totally inaccurate. I have a copy of Magna Carta from 1215 on my wall in the shop, but you're saying the one that we should look at. It's is really the 1225 is thought of as the definitive one, though again with with the caveat that this promise about the common consent of the kingdom, which disappears from Magna Carta, is brought into practice, and, and no one's quite sure. I mean, Simon de Montfort's Parliament is is the definitive point after which we know what's happening. Before that, it's not quite clear how they summoned the kingdom, but. It was always this feeling that a government act is not legitimate if it is not broadly accepted, mm -hmm. um, and and obviously everybody you know everybody wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die so nobody ever wanted to pay taxes, <laughs> but they did understand that they had to pay taxes uh, and that the there would always be higher taxation than you wanted because zero is the ideal number from the point of view of the taxpayer, but that the government must be doing things that were broadly understood to be legitimate public functions and that there were specific ways of stopping it if they weren't. Twelve twenty-five. Twelve twenty-five seems to be the. Uh, well, the Battle of Agincourt was twelve fifteen. No, fourteen fifteen. Oh, fourteen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, don't, don't argue with the historian. Oh, okay. no, 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 it's, it's right. It's right before that that Henry V okay. promises that he won't go editing the petitions after Parliament goes home. <laughs> he needed money. That's how they got to him, right? You yeah. agree to this, or you no know, cash, you yeah, go no fight in France. Hey, with John. Yeah, exactly. There's a bit of a, an obscure debate. I participate in with some online friends uh, about the terminology between a republic and a democracy. I'm just wondering 
what you think about the significance of that. Because to me, it, it's taken me a long time to really get my head around that concept, and, and I've come to a point where I, I do personally see a clear distinction between the two types of government. Yeah, it, it's curious. I mean, the argument that people used to make this when I was in grad school is the Americas are a public, not a democracy, because it does not have unchecked uh, majority rule. And that's a distinction some people draw. But the, it's interesting that the, the term republic, the vulgar understanding is it means not a monarchy, right? But in that sense, Britain's not a republic, so we should make Britain a republic. But Britain actually is a republic in the more sophisticated sense that a republic is a public thing. It is where the government is controlled by the people through a scheme of representation that works. And, uh, and that was an older, I was looking to see if I had this in my, uh, my notes. I, I had this, but I think I cut it out to save uh, ink. Um, but in that sense, the British system was a republic from very early on. Uh, it's just a monarchical republic. Um, but it depends in a way what your definition of democracy is. Democracy is a place where everything is settled by majority rule, uh, and a republic is something where there's a rule of law, and then there's a useful distinction there. Um, yeah, because I think that the concept is that for the republic, you have a small number of laws that are in stone, where democracy is kind of a, a living, moving thing, that, you know, based on the whims of the majority at the time, which is pretty dangerous for the minority. Well, and there's also the story, I mean, the, the American Constitution, of course, is based on popular sovereignty. So if the people are sufficiently determined to do something for long enough, they can do it no matter what it is. But, and there's this story about Alexander the Great when he was, um, he was, you know, having to get dispensed just as personally as people did in those kind of days, and he'd been in his cups, and he made some outrageous ruling, and the woman went, ah, oh, that's, I'll appeal. And he looked at her, how are you going to appeal to? And she said, I'll appeal from Alexander drunk to Alexander sober. <laughs> <laughs> and the American Constitution is meant to constitute an appeal from the people drunk to the people sober. Uh, and, and that's all you can do, right? With popular sovereignty, if the people are sufficiently determined, if they don't sober up, or if they're still insane when they sober up, they can do anything. But there's so many, there's so many you know, the, the process of amending the American Constitution is sufficiently cumbersome that you do have time to think before you do it. Uh, and, and in that sense, again, that, but if a democracy is a place where the people can do anything they want, then the United States is a democracy in that sense. It's just that they've put obstacles in the way of their doing it hastily. John? There's got to be the last question. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier about how the minority, we have to protect the minority. Now, as libertarians, we believe that the individual is the smallest minority and therefore is the one that needs the most protection. Uh, these days, with our constitution, that thing we have, we seem to have gone from individual civil liberties and rights to collective group mm -hmm. rights. Yes. How dangerous do you see that? I mean, I see it as like, if this group is powerful today, they stomp on everyone, right. and then no one's ever on top forever, history has shown that, and then we have the pendulum swinging back the other way, where the ones who are on the bottom are going get, to get back at the other ones. How do we get back to where everyone's got to understand Everyone's got to have due process. The individual has got to be sovereign. That's the minority we got to worry about. Yeah, well, when people like John A. McDonald talk about minorities, they weren't thinking of sort of ethnic terms. What they were thinking of is there are people whose situation is like that of their fellows, and those whose situation is unlike that of their fellows. And so people who are in the majority in terms of their general situation can make laws that are fair on the surface, but specifically impinge on these individuals whose circumstances are less usual. So that was, when they talked about minorities, what they meant is, is that group of individuals who are a minority by virtue of being un relatively unusually situated, like the rich. What The rich as individuals create a odd minority of people who have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the sense of what she meant. The kind of group rights to me, the part of the problem is that when you have group rights, they conflict and there's no way of settling it. So it's, it's incoherent. An incoherent law is bad law. And one of the points that this book I'm just reading about Magna Carta makes that's worth reminding ourselves, the Middle Ages, people didn't think about liberty. They didn't have this abstract notion of liberty, which can mean anything or nothing, including the right to encroach on others. They thought of liberties. They thought of a man as having a whole bunch of specific rights, which combined to make him a free man, and which must be defended from being a free man. And that is one of the ways I'd like to change the terminology. Even Dicey who uh, has, I mean, he talks about this dangerous idea of parliamentary sovereignty, but when Dicey says, in England there's no such thing as freedom of the press. It, it, is, it is misleading to talk about this. 
because that's the sort of top-down, almost collective thing about, well, you're, you journalists have this. So what there is in England is there are a large number of specific acts the state may not do. And there are legal remedies if the state does them. And individuals can't do them either. And the combination of these means that a person can publish a newspaper. He has the right to go to his place of work. He has the right to buy the constituents. He has the right to employ other people to write news and edit and so on. He has the right to distribute his material to willing customers. And all of these come out of the liberties that all Englishmen have to generate the capacity to carry out your business as a journalist. But, and I'm even a little uncomfortable, and I'm, I'm a journalist, so of course you want to get, cut yourself a big piece of the pie. But when people go into court and say, no, 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 freedom of the press means I have these rights. You know, as a journalist, I have no rights that no, anybody else doesn't have. It's just that some of my rights uh, protect activities that I want to engage in that other people don't. Uh, but, again, this comes out of thinking in terms of liberties, prohibitions on interference in your actions by the state or by private individuals, of which you have a large bundle, and which, you know, one of the English rules, no right without, uh, there's, a, there's no remedy without a writ, but the, the idea is you don't have any rights if you don't have legal procedures to protect them. And England developed this amazing system of writs, these particular legal documents you could get, and part of the development of liberty was the right to get them cheaply, because uh, otherwise only the rich could afford justice. Well, if someone had done a particular thing, you could go to the authorities and get them to issue a writ saying either stop doing this or come to court and tell us why you're allowed to do that. And so this way you protect your freedom by protecting each of your individual freedoms. And I would love to see a group swear out a writ in terms of some abstract concept of liberty. It just can't be done. Right? And the critical one is habeas corpus. When someone has been arrested, um, this writ says you've got this person's body, not dead body. It's not about having a corpse. You, you've got this person physically. Now you've got to come into court and explain why you're allowed to do that. Because if you can't, you've kidnapped them. And this doesn't matter if you're the sheriff. Doesn't, it's not just private, it's public individuals too. If you have unlawfully arrested somebody, you're in trouble once there's a writ of habeas corpus. But if there's no such thing as a writ of habeas corpus, how do you get a guy out of jail who's not meant to be there? Complaining that it says every man has the right to be free is no use to you. You need a specific legal remedy for a specific legal situation. And again, I think if we could rephrase it in terms of liberties rather than liberty, that helps. A free man has liberties, and these liberties cannot be infringed. And every time a liberty is infringed, a particular remedy exists. But when you get, you know, the, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, it's so abstract, it's impossible to conceive of specific remedies for breaches of these things. And that means it's just a bunch of hot air. In England, there are, I think, hundreds of different writs by the 14th century. And that means there are hundreds of situations you can find yourself in where you can go and, especially if you know the law, um, they, they, they simplified the system of rights eventually. It was just too much trouble to memorize them all. and led to too many maneuvers and, and cases being dismissed because of typos. Uh, but the, but the, there were, it was all, freedom exists in the interstices of procedure. And in England that really happened. And when it doesn't, any amount of highfalutin language is no good to you. What the, what the Soviet constitution promises you is no help because there aren't writs that you can get enforced to make it not happen. Mm -hmm. Do we have these writs in Canada? <clears throat> writs still exist. I'm, again, I'm, my legal training is non-existent, and therefore my answer is imprecise. But in England in the 19th century, they greatly simplified the system of writs. And I, I believe that we still have a much smaller number of more and more flexible writs than we used to have. They, were just, they got too, uh, too detailed and too specific. And you got this no, if there wasn't a specific writ, if someone found a new twist on malfeasance, you couldn't get at them because there wasn't a specific writ for that. So now they're, they're more flexible and more powerful, but uh, the happiest corpus still exists. So yeah, we, we still have writs. Um, but again, I'm, I'm out of my depth in trying to give you a more detailed answer. I'm sorry, I've got to go. So, yeah, <laughs> what is your, what's the book you're reading on the Magna Carta? Is that just called the Magna Carta? It is called, uh, right here. it's by Jeffrey Hindley. It's called A Brief History of the Magna Carta. A brief history. A brief history. It is quite brief, actually. It's, I mean, toward the end, it got a bit off topic, but it was a good book. Jeffrey Hindley. H I N D L E. quite brief, except for the end. Yeah. But again, I'll tell you, if, you read, if you're going to read one book, because I gave a talk here today, read The Lion and the Throne. Um, my, my name is Catherine Drinker Bowen. It's the book about Edward Cook. Um, and, and you, again, you will, I think, like me, you will say, why did nobody tell me this? What did they. How did they not think it mattered? Crying out loud. How did swindled? John's got to run. Folks, I hope you Thank give you a good round of applause for
I'll tell you something. I'd be interested to have you back to talk on John Adams because the more I've read on him, he's a very, very interesting man. Well, I'll tease you with something. You know, Adams, was he was described as the man perfectly suited to unite the country against himself. Served yeah. one term and was chased out. Yeah, well, yeah, they <laughs> if called, they if called... the slave states were not overrepresented in the Electoral College, he would have won in 1800. Yeah. It, was, it was that weighting of slaves as three-fifths of a person for purposes of presidential representation, though not for actual voting, yeah. that made Jefferson president. And I can't think of a more odious way to win the White House. Yeah, yeah true enough. Jefferson said three slaves when he died? No, the rich, no, Washington did, uh, except it, it was, he freed some, there were a few of his, some of his wife's slaves he didn't. They were going to be free when she died, but she found that having them all watch her for signs of decline was too depressing, so she freed them. Um, no, Jefferson, he was too much in debt. The only ones he freed were, were these were ones related to Sally Hemings, which again brings up the thought that he was... Uh, a singularly disgraceful in his conduct. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, Jefferson was a villain. Yeah. Really was a villain.